The genesis for me um, doing this, when Tom asked me ages ago about finding a topic, and I thought, I'm not really interested in the law that much now where I really want to go and devil. Uh, and I thought, what am I interested in? And I am interested in where the bar's at and where it's going. And the thing that, came, that, that, that tweaked my interest happened some time ago, but someone who'd been at the bar a couple of years said to me, I've not cross-examined anybody yet. And they'd been at the bar more than two years, and I thought, what the hell is going on? Um, and, and of course, it then generated the question, why do people come to the bar, which is one of the things that permeates that little, that simple survey I put out. Why are you here? Are you here because you want to be on your feet, or are you interested in the law and you want to research, you want to do appellate work, um, do you want to do trial work? Um, and so that question sort of came to the fore, and I thought, uh, you know, I'd like to explore it further because uh, obviously, if people are here to do advocacy work, there's no doubt that advocacy work is in decline for a lot of reasons. So I thought I'd have a look at those reasons. Most of them are well known and we, we have, we'll be able to belt through them uh, pretty quickly. And then of course the secondary arm of it is, well, if that's all happening, then what, what can we do about it, which is the harder bit to address. So that's what the, the genesis of the paper is. Um, so I'll take you through it. I don't know, I'm not going to speak to the paper directly, but I'm going to refer to some of the matters in it. The, the stuff up the front in the paper, or I should say the other thing that, that I remember very well that, that probably st was earlier days in terms of the remark about cross-examination, was that over the years as a director of the, of the former floor, when people would come here seeking to be, become readers, and, and so you meet a lot of young people who are coming to the bar, and I used to ask them all the question, so where's your work coming from? You got any, what, where, have you got any sources already lined up? What, what do you expect is going to happen? And so many people come into the bar on a wing and a prayer. Some people say, look, I come from this firm and I expect that they're going to support me. Um, often they're wrong. They think they are and then they don't get supported. Um, and so that's why it's pretty tough yard. So I'm actually quite surprised that so many people are continuing to come to the bar when you realise the number of challenges that the bar's facing. It's a pretty bold move in many respects. But it obviously means when you make that decision, you need to have your ducks in a row. You need to have a pretty good idea about how you see it's going to work and keep your costs down and, as Tom said, have a good software, software package, someone who's able to chase your fees for you because you might go very a long way backward before you go forward. Um, in the old days, when you did, direct, uh, did directions, proceedings or a mention, you'd send fees for 40 bucks. Sometimes solicitor would say, yeah, you'll get paid when this is resolved. And this was a motion at the start of some lengthy case. So five years later, you get a check for 40 bucks, <laughs> you know, which was good. Um, Cranich was the best in terms of paying the, the most junior blokes when, when I first came to the bar and read on, on fourth floor uh, Wentworth Chambers with Richard and the, the late Ted Cowdery, Cranich was there and he used to get me to do his devilling work. He had a, fast, a fantastic array of work, all sorts of fields, and he'd get me to draft advices and stuff and he'd read it and then he'd say, how much do I owe you? And he used to write me a cheque on the spot. It was unbelievable. And, and that was like manna from heaven for, for a young barrister to get paid in Stanta. Doesn't happen much since, you know. Now, you, now you can hang out forever. But um, okay, well, coming to the so that's sort of the background to the to the idea. Um, and Simon said to me just before we started, you know, I hope this is all not going to be doom and gloom, and and it's true, and it needs to be looked at uh, with some balance because obviously there's a lot of people at the bar, a lot of people in this room, most of the people in this room who are doing well and expect to continue to do so. But it would be a silly thing to do to put your head down and not, not expect that you might be affected by change. A lot of people have already been very adversely affected by all sorts of changes uh, and nobody's immune uh, from the impact of it. So the better forearmed you are, the better chance you'll have of dealing with the changes that might affect you. Can I just deal with a couple of things that I found quite interesting in what Tom's written in the first part of this, what he added to my paper, or oh, I shouldn't have said that, things that I researched uh, and Tom proofed and added a couple of footnotes either and did it. But in the first part of the paper when he talks about his learned research into the issue of, of what is truth, and, and I thought here, herein lies the difference between a very clever bloke like Tom who, uh, who has researching skills that are remarkable and me. He goes to the source documents about conversations between Pontius Pilate and Jesus and cites a million cases. I thought immediately about Alan Bennett's line that I remember from years ago in talking of truth, his line in that show was, what is truth and what is fable? Where is Ruth and where is Mabel? <laughs> Which I always quite liked. 
And the second thing that came to mind was got nothing to do with anything other than musical theatre, Jesus Christ Superstar, the conversation between Pilate and Jesus. When, uh, when, when Jesus says to Pilate, it's all done to music and I won't sing, Jeff will do that later. Um, and uh, Jesus says to Pilate, uh, I, look, I look for truth and find that I get damned and Pilate says to him, but what is truth? Is truth a changing law? We both, we both have truths, is mine the same as yours? Which is a very interesting line from a musical, I might add. So that's the difference between Tom and I. He goes to the books, I go to the musicals. <laughs> it's a bit like the Bible, I've never read it, but I, I saw the movie. <laughs> uh, I won't tell you how it ended, though. I have, have to wait. So it's interesting when you look... It, it's very helpful to have the, the, the history of the adversarial system and then... And then noting just how, how long it's been the subject of criticism and doubt, and interesting that uh, in paragraph six of the paper, he, there's a quote from Sir Owen Dixon at a dinner party when he says, are you interested in the, aren't you interested in justice? He said, I have, I have nothing, I don't have anything to do with justice, he says to the woman. I sit in a court of appeal where none of the facts are known. One third of the facts are excluded by normal frailty and memory one third by the negligence of the profession and the remaining third by archaic laws of evidence. <laughs> See, well, what's changed? Uh, if anything, it's probably got worse. And then uh, in paragraph nine, there's reference to self-interest being not conducive to the search for the truth, if that's what we're really all about, which, which I, perhaps in the criminal law, that has more of a, a ring of truth, as it were, but uh, not so in the, the civil law, it seems to me. But, in terms of the search for truth, uh, not self-interest not being uh, conducive to finding it, um, these features are identified. Opposing testimony is routinely discredited, regardless of whether it is true or not. Material facts are often omitted from or denied in pleadings or are withheld due to privilege claims. Procedural exigencies exist to require proceedings to be completed in a reasonable time. I don't know where that one came from. That can't be right. Um, the Evidence Act and civil procedure rules allow for the possibility of excluding probative evidence. Council can engage in sophistry and rhetorical manipulation. Let's perish the thought. <laughs> the primary objective wishes to obscure the truth. Oh, wash my mouth out. That can't possibly be right. The party is not required to act candidly, subject to discovery obligations. Now, there's a little can of worms. The party is under no duty to reveal the existence of evidence which is unfavourable, and nor is the party's lawyer. I'm not sure if that's still the case, I might add, in light of recent experience. But uh, I was in a, a discovery fight before Nyperin recently, and at the end of the, this is probably common to a lot of you, but it wasn't to me, for category 44 in the, in the categories of evidence sought by the way of discovery was any other document that might help or hinder your case. And I said, well, in light of 43, why are we arguing about any of the others? It's a claim for everything that might be relevant at these proceedings. I couldn't believe that it was there, but apparently that's a commonly appearing request. Give me anything else that, that might help or hurt us. Well, there you go. So then paragraph 11, I just want to touch on a couple of things before I come to a summary of the problems. Um, in paragraph 11, uh, having, dealt, having identified several problems with the system that we're all well aware of, in paragraph 11 we say this, as a result, the adversarial model is undergoing rapid change as litigants come to realise that victory is often, often pyrrhic when weighed against the costs involved in achieving it. Um, in other words, yes, you might be able to get it by a rights-based system. You might be, but it's hard because there's so many limitations in the system. But in any event, even if you had cost confidence that truth will win out or justice will occur, it costs you too much to pursue it. Um, and in any event, as people start to think more uh, laterally about it, they say, look, resolution of the matter is more important to me um, than being right. We want the dispute over. And there's a lot written about this, and of course a lot of people have this in experience. I, I read an American article recently where a guy said, uh, an author, the author said this, that he acted for somebody when he got his first interest in ADR, acted for a client in a two-year arbitration that cost millions of dollars, and they swept the floor with the other side, they killed him, they had a complete victory. And at the end of it, the client said, yeah, that's terrific, but I'd rather, I'd rather we hadn't gone through that. That was a two-year diversion out of what I do, which is run a business. And the guy said it sort of struck home to him that people say even when you win completely, which is not all that common, orders of costs and a lot of money achieved, and people say, well, yeah, that's all very well, but how the hell can I avoid that next time? You know, so winners aren't grinners. And as we usually say, most people lose 
in one way or another when you go through that sort of system. So it's got downsides. So resolution becomes uh, more important. Um, there's a paper that I've often referred to that, that you, I'll, I'll put a reference to, it's not in, in it currently, which is called Judicial Case Management and the Problem of Costs, written by um, Chief Justice Also, which he delivered at an ADR uh, seminar two years ago or three years ago for the bar. And in it, he actually says quite candidly that, you know, that he's very troubled by, you know, what, what used to be briefs with ribbons around them have now blown out to six trolleys and a phalanx of lawyers. You know, the court's not very happy what, the, what they can see is happening uh, to the way disputes are resolved. And he told a story about, he said, when I first became a, a young solicitor, he said, he said the principal of the firm, who was a very senior bloke, well regarded, he said, when clients came in and, and they'd tell them their problems, he'd say, well, what, what can I do to help? What would you like me to do? He said, he put his arm around their shoulders and said, well, what can I do to help you resolve this dispute? And he said, and hardly ever was the, was the idea, we'll sue the arse off somebody, um, that they'd find a way to try and resolve the dispute so the person could get back to what they wanted to do. And he was telling this story, saying that's what he remembers of his early days as a solicitor and contrasting it to what he sees now sitting on you know, the State Court, uh, court of Appeal in, in the Federal Court. So he, and the secondary thing he says in there that is might, might be surprising to, to some, but he, he effectively says that the efforts made about managing costs really hasn't worked. Case management has not been successful. The promise has not been delivered. And it's a, quite an interesting uh, article. He also identifies the third thing he does in a quite a blunt way, he, ident he identifies two categories of lawyers. I'm not sure if he uses the language in there that he used on his feet, but he talks about those that are interested in dispute resolution in a genuine way and the gougers, two categories of lawyers. And uh, I said to him afterwards, I said, yeah, that was, that was, you're about the only person around who can get away with saying something like that. If a barrister got up and made those sorts of noises, their practice might take a big hit. So uh, he was very honest about it. So, so with all those pressures, of course, we then move in the, in, in the continuing challenge to the adversarial system. Um, and so will rights-based dispute uh, resolution, is, is that going to continue, is the big picture question. The paper then turns to the question of the problems, and rather than take you through it, because some of you will have read it, but in any event, uh, uh, I wanted to deal with it in a slightly different way, because other things came to mind. But let me tell you what I think are... Uh, what have I got? I've identified sort of nine areas that have areas of, of impact that, that could be regarded or are regarded as adverse uh, impacts uh, on us or adverse factors in terms of the bar. And the first one that came to mind is the very nature of barristers themselves, that I, if I'm any indication, I'm a terrible business person. I, I couldn't run a business to save my bloody life. Um, so many barristers are conservative. They're not naturally business-minded or business uh, operators. They're small business persons. Some of them have their head in their sand, or a lot of them too busy to work to stick up and stick their head up and figure out whether or not what they're doing is in the interest of their financial uh, welfare overall. There's also a blindness, I think, probably starting to drop, uh, or is starting to drop, that everything will stay the same as it's always been and will all be okay. Um, but also resistance to change, simply because you know conservatism leads to that. And I'm not criticising it; it's a common feature. A lot of people resist change. And it raised me with me, and Kenzie and I were discussing <laughs> these ideas. I think he and Tom was astonished when I told him the first story about resistance to change. In 1981, in Wardell Chambers, when Marcus Ironfield was the head of the floor, Barry Toomey and a million other people, you guys are too young to know, or most of you aren't. And we had a debate on the floor as to whether we should get a fax machine. <laughs> and, and the result was it was voted down on the basis we didn't need it. Uh, and I thought that was terrific. That was very funny. <laughs> Kenzie then interjected and reminded us of a, of a debate when they were setting up the second floor of Selborne about the idea of having one of those, what was then called a Telstra, or it wasn't Telstra in those days, what was it called? Telecom, telephone commander system where you could transfer calls and throughout the whole floor, thought it was a good idea. And John Steele initially was attracted towards it, so Kenzie tells it, uh, until he realised that someone, he thought that someone might be able to use his line to call Juneau, Alaska and then he promptly voted against it. So they didn't go with a modern telephone system because uh, of the risk of the bills. The third issue, the third, fourth and fifth issue all have arisen since we've been in this building. Um, the, first one, the, the first one that's indicative and it's much more recent and it's still an ongoing problem amongst barristers' floors, there's no doubt, is the issue about the books. 
I know it's cracking at last, but for the last 10 years, a vexed debate about whether we should have books or whether they're too expensive, oh, and whether we should share, and people will say they want to smell their own books and all the rest of the stuff. But the cost of books was becoming prohibitive, and we've been slow to react to get modern. I remember Burbage saying one of his ideas, which was clearly right many, many years ago, he said we should, we should be ditching the multiple copies, getting rid of the services, get online, do all these things, and let's cut down the cost of the books. And we did, of course. We stopped a lot of services that were costing a fortune. But there was, because of a tradition of books, and we want to have books around, and I like books, I do too, but it wasn't very prudent. And the duplication of books, even on a floor of barrows, is ridiculous. And the cost. So that was an issue that's symptomatic of conservatism. The other thing he said, and it's now ringing with me in my mind, he said, why don't we hire a librarian researcher with high order computer skills? who can maintain the library, and then when people need some research done, they can go to that person who's got research skills, and uh, they can save you a, you know, a lot of time. That was a great idea. That was a sort of more of a business approach to the way we practice. But we still, I think some floors do it. I, I think, do, do they not? I see some people nodding. Um, but that seemed like a good idea, but it didn't carry much favour here for a decade or more, where, even when it came up repeatedly. And as did the, the, the matter that now seems to be coming to the fore and from the surveys and from my own thinking about it, is this idea of floors setting up their own law firm, activating direct access and having uh, a law firm on the, on the floor, if you like. We could dedicate a section of the floor, set up a law firm, have some solicitors in there. There's no restriction in the bar rules. Jeff, Jeff checked them for me, even because I'd said in the paper it was probable that barristers could be shareholders in a, in a practice, same as you can can't be a director, obviously you can't be an employee, but you could, have, you could have a solicitor's firm on the floor, then you could market yourself heavily as litigators are us, I think is the name I, I, I put in there, where we're a firm, uh, there's a firm of advocates um, who are all on a panel of this uh, solicitor's firm, and uh, that seems to be a model that's getting increasing interest. Indeed, the fact that it's getting so much interest is a manifestation of people's concern that we're not getting a fair uh, share of the pie anymore for a lot of reasons to which we'll come or I'll come in as briefly as I can but I thought those factors were interesting in terms of the nature of the beast about people at the bar how many people at the bar really have a sense of how to run a business let alone a small business as I say I'm hopeless I don't know how many people here think that they're good at it maybe there are and maybe that's a new thing it's certainly not part of as I understand it part of what they get trained barristers get trained and is there any part of a detailed analysis about how to run a practice, or is it only a, tract, a trust account issue that you're required to know about? And that's even only for solicitors. I don't know what the bar course trains uh, people in. What's, what does a new grad say around here? Does the bar course tell you much about how to run a business? David, is it? Zero. Well, there you go. And yet that's what you're doing. You're entering into a small business, and, and unless you get your own training, you've got none. So that's, that's the nature of the beast and maybe that's time for self-reflection about whether you're any good at it and whether or not you might want to do something about being better at running a business. The second thing is professional changes and this is a big topic and I'm going to touch on a couple of things. I don't, I'm not close enough to the Bar Association to know whether they do a very good job. I've always been a bit peripheral. I now for my sins am on an ADR committee. That's the first time I've ever been involved on, a, on a, an association committee. I've stayed away from it. Um, but it's not really a trade union, uh, as is commonly understood. And there are a lot of things that have happened that people complain about. I just noticed a couple that, that have significant changes. The abolition of the two council rule has had a major impact on the junior bar. Um, and it was always rightly used, the two council rule always made sense. And it still does. If you want to get a senior barrister and you hire them at six or seven grand a day, and you say, oh, well, we only want one barrister, so I always say to clients, doesn't make any sense. I've got a good bloke who can come in, or a good girl who can come in and help, uh, and they charge three grand a day, and they can do 50% of the work, and I don't want to do it anyway. So you've really got to talk sense to people about how they spend their money, and do what you can to protect the junior bar, because they're getting slaughtered. And someone said in, one, in the surveys that the consequence now, with, with the abolition of the rule, which I hadn't thought about, for, pe for, senior, for Silk, who I haven't got a great deal of work or are looking for more, they're starting to do work that you wouldn't ordinarily expect a Silk to do. Yeah. So rather have up work than no work, so I'll do the work that a junior barrister would have ordinarily got. Well, that doesn't help the development of the bar, uh, and that makes it very difficult for the junior bar to get the experience they need to then attract work in their own right. The debate about barristers' work drove me crazy. 
It's hard to believe that in this day and age the, the profession and the association could be having an argument about the definition of barrister's work and that it should be narrow. Hello? Why would that be? Because the purists think that all we should do is X, Y and Z? Well, you know, get real. I found that an astonishing and, and misguided debate, as it turned out. You couldn't possibly draw a line um, in terms of what barristers do along the lines that were suggested. The defence of judges. Like, I know there's a lot less judges that de deserve getting defended, but that's been... <laughs> that, that's on it in the breach now. Years ago, until Daryl Dawson... Was it Daryl Dawson? who was the, the first attorney, federal attorney general who gave up the ghost on protecting judges. Prior to him, whenever there was an attack on a judge, the attorney general was the person who'd come out in vigorous defence of the, of the, of the uh, judiciary. That doesn't happen now. And of course now they actually, the politicians go out and actively slam them, hence that litigation in Victoria against the ministers, which Dyson Hayden, Hayden then responded to and said, no, I think they should be fair game because there's a lot of gooses on the bench who shouldn't be there. His article's quoted in the paper, but, but pretty vociferous challenge. Um, so they're things, and surveys, like when I did that simple survey, when I, and I've got 12 or so back already when I'm very pleased to have them. But what you glean so quickly. But when, does the bar, when do we ever get surveyed about what we think uh, about a whole swag of things? Like why isn't that done every, every year? A proper survey about issues of concern. It seems to me to be a bread and butter thing that the association should do. So there are things about, the, and as I say, I don't want to be hypercritical, the people who spend their time and energy on behalf of the profession are to be applauded. Uh, then there's the change in the clerk's role. Like years ago, the clerk's role was very was pivotal in terms of the, the allocation of work and attracting work to the floor. That's really gone by the by, and we've a lot of us have been involved in countless debates over the years about what the role of the clerk should be. But the idea of the of the, of the clerk now being sort of the doyen for the of attracting work to the floor, and and people that solicitors go to for expertise and advice about you know who we should use for this sort of case. That seems to have died away, and most clerks now are, are running the floor, managing individual practices, but it really has changed a lot. Um, the clerk seems to not have the sig same significant role it used to have uh, in, 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 barristers, in barristers getting work, and of course, as we see, there's a lot less work when it's coming through the door that the clerk can allocate for reasons um, that we can discuss. And of course, from a big picture point of view, the perception of, of lawyers, and I think of the bar still, is not good. I don't think the public think that the bar's up to much. I mean, I, uh, that, I don't know, but I think we're probably still seen as in good company with um, second-hand car salesmen. But uh, again, like what, what's being done about the perception of the bar? Um, and what are we, and as a floor, what we could do, like we could sponsor children, we could do all sorts of things. We could, we could put our, bend our backs into a cause and publicise what this floor is doing so that the community has a different perspective on how we, how we are to be regarded, that we care about the community and those we act for. But there doesn't seem to be much energy put into that, those sorts of initiative. Homelessness is an, is an obvious one, they're all out there. We've got members of the, of the association who sleep out overnight occasionally, but maybe there needs to be a lot more done. So our, the image of barristers, the image of lawyers is a big question. You know the old jokes about how many, what do you call 500 lawyers at the bottom of the ocean? A good start. Uh, and that milking the cow, that famous print of the, of, the, of the barrister sitting there milking the cow and the clients at both ends, one pulling the tail, one pulling the horns, that's on the wall in the federal court in the mediation rooms. <laughs> I mean, I'll be back it. And I think they just point to that and say, now you know why you're here. So there you go, so professional changes and, and, and uh, individualism, rampant individualism, it's often said now you catch and kill your own. Okay, that seems to be the way the world has gone, but it's not a good thing. And I think a lot of what we're going to end up thinking about here is how we turn that around and become a lot more collegiate to help each other. And it is happening. This is what Tom started here with. This is a great idea. Suggestions that have come up about the oh and s blokes getting together and seeing how they can promote themselves because we've got quite a coterie of expertise in that field. So there's a lot of things that can be done at a profession and at a floor level. I don't want to spend any more time on that. There's too much to cover. The third area is legislative change. These are more obvious things. Legislative change that are reducing or taking, removing rights or taking away rights. It's happening. Uh, in industrial areas, unfair contracts law was abolished or effectively abolished. It had been on the books for you know, 50 or more years excluding lawyers from jurisdictions, mandating ADR. There's a paper by uh, 
uh, Chief Justice Bathurst that I didn't have a chance to read again, but I've read it before. And I think in that paper he identified 72 statutes where mediation is now expressly referred to. So the government is getting on board. It's, there's no doubt where it's heading that people are trying to, to move away from judges having to decide cases and sometimes mandating it that you have to go through that process. Certainly true in family law. Um, I don't know how many others are actually compulsory before you can litigate, uh, but those that are here might know more about that. And of course, leave hurdles. Um, not just with respect to appearances, like it's happening in the workplace in the Fair Work Commission, and it's become an absolute dog's breakfast, asking for leave to appear and tribunals deciding whether lawyers should be allowed in at all, or whether the punter and someone from the, from the employer can fight it out amongst themselves. It's a joke, and it's just, just a complete mess. And then leave hurdles for appeal. The more of those that come down the pipe, well, it's harder to, to, get a, to, to challenge uh, uh, matters. The fourth area is economic change, especially since the GFC. Um, everybody's more, more demanding more bang for their buck. There were a number of surveys that I'd looked at for other purposes, surveys in Europe uh, in the wake of the GFC in Europe, and, they, and the surveys revealed that companies were giving directions in-house that they did not want to spend money on litigation and giving firm directions to their in-house people to, to explore matters by ADR options. They just said, we're not, this is something we can save a great deal of money on, which we need to, so forget external litigation. Uh, only as an absolute last resort, but no longer can you just sh shuffle everything out. So th there's no doubt that that, that economic change uh, has had a big impact on the movement away from litigation. And query whether it's ever going to return, I would think the answer is that I don't, I think the trend is to spend less money on litigation. Government departments, someone referred to in their, in their survey, uh, I do a lot of work for the Commissioner of Payroll Tax and uh, even these big bodies that where there's a lot of money flowing, they, they do not want to litigate. They don't. And, uh, and there are a lot of other government departments that simply don't want to get caught up in big litigation. They're trying to find ways to avoid it. Uh, one doesn't need to place judgments. I, I make you, as you know, I'm a supporter of, of ADR mechanisms, so it's not a bad thing, but it's having an impact on the bar that needs to be acknowledged and, and thought about. And of course, there's a massive increase in community awareness via the internet about the flaws in the system, perceived lack of justice, the inadequacy of judges, too many wrong decisions, as, it, as they're described, not meeting community expectations as if that should be the yardstick of day-by-day -day justice in the courts, outrageous court costs, which we know are true, uh, regrettably, but all the more fuelled by a lot of ignorant, self-interested and some crazy politicians, and too many irresponsible journalists who rank sensation and scandal above all else. So it's not like we're getting a fair shake, even though there are problems, it's getting blown out of all proportion. And that's not helping anybody, and it's certainly not helping the bar. So the impact of those considerations have now resulted in these things that are obvious. The knock-on impact of those first four or five considerations are being increased in self-represented litigants, either due to self-education about the law via the internet, which is happening. People think, I can, I can figure this out, I'll be right. And or incapacity to pay. And you'll see in the paper the reference to how many special leave applications were self-represented litigants. 46% of applications for special leave were self-represented litigants. <clears throat> These stats are just astonishing and they tell you that people either are mad uh, or they think they're not, they think they're clever, or by and large you'll find, as has happened in, in, in America where it's been looked at in California, incapacity to pay is a massive problem. Um, there's an article I'll dig out in California, it's said to be around 80% of people now don't appeal with lawyers. In 1971, it was one or two, and now it's in 40 years or 50 years, it's now about 80% of people don't have lawyers. They can't afford to be represented. And it's happening here, there's no doubt. There's not, there's not the same level of work being done here, I might add, about looking at this and analysing it. We seem to be a bit of a backwater with proper research on, on a lot of these important considerations. There's a lot of stuff written on this overseas, and it's all pointing in that direction. So there's an increased interest in, through education, which is slow, and demand for ADR, mediation, restorative justice, non-adversarial justice is, is sort of a buzzword now, right at the heart of it. We don't want to just determine things adversarially. Can't we do it in a non-adversarial way? There's some very good books written on the very topic. There's a new idea called what's conventionally called MedArb, which, is, which I think is going to take off. It's now in the, in the Commercial uh, 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 Arbitration Act. Uh, where you can hire a mediator 
uh, on the basis that if the mediation fails, that the same person can then arbitrate what's not resolved. There's a lot of resistance to it. People say, oh, how can you do that? You know, th things might be said in mediation and you know, how could the same person arbitrate? The answer is if you want the dispute, dispute resolved, you can then, you might want to temper what you say in, in, in private session in mediation if you're worried about it. But if you trust the mediator, uh, which is what you hope is the cornerstone of the process in any event, then you should never fear their ability to make an impartial decision on matters in issue. The rule that governs the transition from mediator to arbitrator is that you have to disclose prior to arbitrating anything in every anything that's been said to you in private session that you think bears on your deliberation, so that the other side can then have an opportunity to comment on it. I did a contract matter in a VMO dispute in Canberra, a big dispute with only one doctor, but he raised about a thousand points and said he'd been underpaid. We mediated for two days and most of it resolved, but there were two things that couldn't be. Um, there were senior practitioners on both sides. And uh, uh, at the end of it, they then said, right, well, we now want you to uh, arbitrate the last two issues. I said, does anyone want to say anything more, any more written submissions? Or, no, no, you've got it all, you've got everything you need. And I went away and wrote a decision, uh, which they, accept, they, they agreed that they would accept. That process worked fantastically for them. Um, and I think that's what's, that's where the tension comes with ADR. People want, people want resolution and they want it earlier. And if they have a failed mediation, they, may, they say, my God, if the mediation fails, I'm going to end up in the court system. And so people are out and say, no, no, you don't have to do that. Maybe you can still keep it in your hands or keep it private. Just commit to be bound by the outcome. And you don't need a new process and a new person. So that, that is happening and it will continue to happen. So, so there's much more interest in ADR and demand for ADR and then the courts are starting to order it much more routinely. Five years ago, I would think it would have been regarded as more exceptional, especially early on in a case. What's the norm now? Is it, is it routinely ordered at an early part? Is that, is that fair comment? That me mediation is raised early on in proceedings? So then associated with all this com complaint about the legal system is the fixation on case management rules um, and, and that they can deliver quick and cheap justice. And those provisions in the Civil Procedure Act are just thought they're terrific. Um, talk about aspirational statements um, that aren't binding. When you look back how far the legal system has been criticised, Charles Dickens, Abraham Lincoln, and then latterly uh, Alsop, who says that whatever attempts we try to make to try and make judges be good managers and control costs that just haven't worked. So a fixation about it, about uh, case management, uh, is not helping either because it just doesn't work. The two ideas that come to mind from recent talk with Kenzie about it, this idea of no affidavits, that we want to hear you know, Viva Voce evidence. So, oh, that's good. How long is this thing going to take now? Um, uh, Kenzie had an example in a big case where the parties had cooperated and had affidavits to burn up the wazoo at great cost, even resolved the objections to affidavits. The judge who ordered that then was different when the trial came on. He said, I'm not going to allow you to read any affidavits. I want to hear it all orally. Half a million dollars was spent getting ready for a trial based on affidavits, and the judge just said, not in my court. <laughs> And, that, and, there, and, and discovery is the same sort of problem. Like this idea of trying to limit discovery, that's the theory. It doesn't appear to me to be the practice in my recent experience. The, the judge, in my parent in the matter I was in, he ultimately was applying a test. Oh, I can't really determine when that's going to help me, so I think you should produce it. You know, I don't really know yet. So, yeah, you produce that. 43 categories of discovery after the evidence is on it was like the old days. So I don't get it, this idea of discovery after all the evidence is on. If the logic of it is it should be confined, you need a special order then, not a general order, 43 categories as if uh, the rules are the same. So, so those, uh, so all their, their problems that, that, that are impacting on the profession and, and people's attitude to us who participate in it. Um, the seventh proposition is that, that, that follows from what I've said earlier is that solicitors are much better business operators than barristers. They just are. They're more attuned. They spend more time and money growing and supporting their client base and being adapt and adapting to change. So as, the, as the, ch the world changed in economic circumstances and their clients wanted to spend less money, well, one of the obvious things to do is we'll do this in-house, we won't brief the bar. We can do this. And so it happens that there's special counsel, that designation within law firms now, and saying to clients, we can save you a lot of money, we'll do it ourselves, we won't go to the bar. So, so they've, they've been responsive, they've got strategies and because they're sort of the gatekeepers, the clients come to them first, 
So they just stop briefing the bar because it's in their own self-interest and they satisfy their own client's need in, in a tighter world. So the world of, in the old days, when, when, when Kenzie and I were much, much, much younger, the idea of briefs arising with a pink ribbon around them, please advise generally and draft any pleadings, mm -hmm. Uh, so that eventually the solicitor's file would come up and they'd hand it over to you straight up and you'd have control of it from the get-go. I, I don't know if anyone has that experience anymore, do they? Does, do, has anybody set the bar higher barristers right from the start and, and let them run the cases? Um, so what happens now is that uh, increasingly they do the junior barristers' bread and butter work in-house, promote using their own sort of designated SCs or, 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 or other people. Um, some increasingly, I, I don't know how qualitatively how one can say how much, but they do the affidavits themselves. Uh, they attend settlement conferences uh, and without their barristers, because they don't have barristers yet. In mediations, I often say, well, we're all here and the trial's about to go. Did, was there any effort made at trying to settle this? And the solicitors say, yeah, yeah, we had a meeting uh, at the time of filing and uh, we went there and we told them we wanted 300 grand. They offered, they offered us five grand for piss off money. So we're only there 10 minutes. So that was it. That was the effort made to resolve the, <laughs> the matter. And then it wasn't revisited until a whole lot of money had been spent on getting ready for a full trial. And then the matter settled at mediation in any event uh, on the eve of the trial. The same with mediations. Client, a lot of solicitors now recommend mediations or they can't avoid it even though they don't like it. But increasingly they don't brief counsel to attend the mediation. I've noticed a discernible change in the last 10 years in, in the arrival of, of, of barristers at mediation. Um, I think it has changed. I think it's dropping, is my own experience. Um, and so solicitors are doing more of that work, so that's shutting us out of work. And then, and then of course, doing the, the low order, or a lot of low order appearance work. A lot of the surveys said that. Work that used to be the bread and butter of juniors at the bar, directions proceeding, procedural disputes, interlocutory fights, whatever, a lot of solicitors are doing them themselves. They don't need the bar. And I'm told even more so increasingly now, even some trial work, senior lawyers within law firms are doing the trial work. One of the surveys referred to partners at PwC doing tax matters at NCAT, running fully blown um, you know, tax issues in NCAT as partners of a law firm. So, um, so what is the trend as a matter of generality? Barristers get briefed as late as possible after most of the trial preparation is done and mediation has failed. And then they face the bad news that the barrister is often bound to give them, potentially at great risk their own relationship with the firm, that this has been stuffed up and now it has to settle. Because it can't go to trial because there's major shortcomings in the evidence or it hasn't been, the pleadings are misconceived. And so when you eventually do get the pass, it's a hospital pass. And then you've got to tell the solicitors it's got to be resolved because of the time and money that's been spent has been wasted. Well, that's a terrible outcome. The, the, what's the overall impact of all that? That barristers are less, getting less time on their feet because there's less work around, and so they're not getting the, the experience. They have less opportunity to cross-examine, and as I say, that seems palpable. Then they don't attract work because people say, we want someone with the experience. You say, well, I wish, I wish I could help you, but I can't get a guernsey. And so that favours the, the small, so that's where the work tends to gravitate to more experienced people. So the junior bar are in a pretty invidious position in terms of how you protect them and how you ensure uh, that they get a go. And that's why I said as senior counsel, the idea of taking a junior along or even paying for the junior yourself, which I've certainly done, um, if they're prepared to, prepare to pay my silk rates and I don't want to do a lot of the work, then I'll pay for the junior. And then the junior gets to go to court and uh, it works, so it's a de facto, I can bring about a two council outcome as long as I don't ask them to pay. They don't whinge about my fees and I get to control how much of the work I do. Um, I, I think that works well. And the junior bar certainly needs it. The, um, you miss out on workers not experienced, late payment of fees, like it, the world is conspiring against the way things are working. You get less work and then you wait longer to get paid. <laughs> um, you know, you'll get paid when we get paid, maybe. You know, if Burbage was here now, he'd be on his feet with 94 examples of how the solicitors' big wads of money came in and they cleared their debt, and then they said, well, where am, I, am I getting paid? He said, no, oh, no, we haven't got funds for you yet, oh. but you've been paid. Yeah, well, you can wait. <laughs> so that's not good. So there, and the final way that that presented itself, these problems about the changing profession, came through to me, and I was on the Silk Selection Committee. It's now six or seven years ago. But the impact of the lack of... Of the, of the decrease in litigation is palpable when you get to silk selection. 
because everyone has to fill in these forms setting out what you've done in the last 18 months. Uh, Ingmar did the best one I'd ever seen, which was a full, absolutely comprehensive. Na parties, nature of the issues, um, you know, all the rest of it in full, full detail and then resolution. And on the right hand side, it would say settled at mediation before Fitzgerald J, settled at mediation, Bill settled. And so a lot of these cases that were cranked up and had very interesting issues to run, they got resolved, they never got on their feet. And then people say, well, how? And no wonder the judges are saying, we don't know this person, or they're here as junior counsel, they haven't been on their feet in front of me. I don't know. So they get four or five votes from the judiciary, and then you're a dead duck. Because in the, no matter what else you've got to say about yourself, if the judiciary don't support you, at least to a reasonable extent, you've got a big problem getting silk. Um, there, there's no doubt about that, because they seem to be the people who are observing how good you are on your feet as an advocate. And so hence the, hence the issue now, which is live, although it's hard to deal with and not being responded to, I don't think yet, is changing the criteria for getting silk. If people aren't on their feet as much, then you've got to, and you still want to have senior counsel, then you've got to start figuring out what criteria are going to come to the fore to replace them or as adjunct. And, hen, and hence now the debate about ADR, how, you, how do you function as a mediator? Are you a good advocate at mediation? Which are private processes that people don't get to see. So it, it, you can see it, it, it is so palpable in the silk selection process, the impact of what's happening to the bar, because people just aren't getting seen the way they used to, less people know them uh, for their court craft. The two last ones which I'll just mention, which are obvious, the impact of, of technology, smart computers doing the research. Uh, I'm, I'm no, uh, I'm a dinosaur, as we know. Um, but I know that I have sp I've spoken to people from Ernst & Young who were talking about the, com the smart computers in the, in the field of medicine, how the doctors don't need to diagnose. Now you shove in all the parameters and ev all, everything and you ask the computer you know, for the differential diagnosis about all sorts of things. And I'm told it's the same with law now, that you can, f you can funnel in all sorts of parameters and the computer can give you a fairly good idea what the outcome, what you need to know and what the outcome is going to be. Now the impact on that for the firms that pick up that technology is that they'll earn less revenue because I'll have smart commuters doing a lot of the basal work, and as their revenue stream drops, well, they'll have more pressure to save costs elsewhere, and they won't need the bar to do research because they'll have a computer that can do it for them. I don't know much about that world, but it's, it's certainly moving at a pace, and the signs aren't terrific in terms of those waiting at the end. The final thing is age and solicited retirement. It's a terrible thing. I feel sorry for the old blokes at the bar, I really do, because, you know, <laughs> it, uh, oh, look, you know, Perish, perish, perish the thought, but you know, to get old and still be at the bar, uh, really. But <laughs> thank you for that. I, I'll, I'll take that as support. Thank you. Um, solicitor retirement, I, I think one of the clerks that we spoke to, because we did a bit of a survey of the clerks as well, talking about just that problem that barristers staying on into their later years because they're having a good time or, or don't want to go home for whatever reason. Um, <laughs> might not have a home to go to. <laughs> <laughs> um, and yet their solicitor base has long since died or retired, they've gone and all of a sudden you say, well where's my work coming from now? So you can't afford to sit back, you've got to continue to refresh your client base as you get older um, to ensure that you've got a continual flow of work. If you don't, you'll sit around saying, well, waiting for the phone to ring, which you really can't afford to do, it might not ring at all, or it will ring very rarely. So they're, they're the nine propositions. So the answer is, you say, well that's a lot of doom and gloom. In one sense, it's, it's not doom and gloom in the sense that it's not beyond uh, rectification, but there, it means that you have to be extremely uh, active in, in recognising that if you, if you fall asleep or you sit idly by, you might find yourself in, in positions that you don't want to be in. So what we've done then at the end of the paper, then I'll, I'll cut through to the, to the chase in this regard. Um, just, for, just a, a, a thing that we've been discussing in the last few days, which is troubling, that needs to be mindful of. With the, with a decrease in the amount of work, you've got to be you've got to be vigilant about your independence, because in paragraph 27 under a heading cautionary note, you know this idea that I want to appear to be tough and barristers uh, often have that persona, you know that I'm tough and I'll fight and we won't settle. Kenzie and I had a senior counsel opponent years ago. It's always stuck in my craw. He's managed to forgive. I haven't who in a major case said, I don't settle cases. Um, so that sort of attitude towards dispute resolution, and others that say, our oh, mediation's only a speed hump, you know, we don't really take it seriously. You know, that sort of attitude, tough guys, you know, we'll see you in court. 
But you don't want to get caught up with, with uh, the, having clients that are tough who effectively tell you what they want you to do um, because, because they want to be tough. They think they're tough and they want you to be tough. Well, and that's where the independence cuts in. You've got to say, well, that might be your call, but I'm not that desperate for money or that unethical that I'm prepared to put and do things that I shouldn't put or do. And that's, a, that's an issue. It's important that the independence comes to the fore. When economics get tight, there's a tendency to say, well, God, I need the work. Um, and they want me to do this, you know, maybe I can run that. Well, it, it's, a, it's a rod for your own back and it might bite you later on, especially if you apply for silk and you have a reputation for being someone who is prepared to run anything, seemingly because, or even misconceived, because your client wants you to. So, as a lot of the surveys suggest, um, you've got to be firm, uh, you've got to earn respect and trust. The ways to do that is to demonstrate that your skill that, you are, that you're skilled in the fields you work in, that you are responsive. That idea of quick turnaround is a big thing. Uh, you've got to look busy and be busy. You've got to deliver quality. I was going to, I had to, you've got to look attractive and I thought, well, we can't possibly, I've crossed that one out. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks, mate. Thank you. Just wait till I get the eyebrows up. Uh, Simon, Simon. <laughs> And you've got, to, you've got to be flexible and do what you can. Once you have a solicitor base or a client base, you've got to demonstrate that you're flexible enough to do what you can to help them get things done as quickly as possible. So the starchy, you know, I'll see you in my chambers. Like it's broken down a lot. Like it's much more common now, it certainly has been in my practice, to go to solicitors' offices and they think it's terrific. They've got 94 files. They don't want to bring a trolley up here because this, this crazy notion every time they come to a conference, they've got a bag that you take if you were leaving town for the rest of your life. <laughs> they bring every piece of paper just in case you might want it. I was, well, it's only a conference. I didn't invite you to stay. You know? <laughs> so if you say, I'll come down there, they say, well, wait, this bloke's terrific. You, you, he's, you'll come down here and we can... And then you can use their administrative staff, which is... And get lunch. And get lunch. <laughs> <laughs> and, and dinner, Jay, Jay spends half a life at Solicitor's premises at night. So, this is a statement of fact. Is it not? Don't answer that. So, so, what, so if, what does that all say, apart from the obvious things about maintaining your independence, because if you don't, at your peril, be and all the obvious things about being good at your craft, but what do you got to do now to push back to try and keep a fair share of the the, the game? And it's in paragraph 28, and there's a, a number of factors. Um, what are they? What are they? A lot. This idea of, and of course, and this is where the conservatism came in, I think, or comes in. Like for years, we didn't market ourselves. For a long time, we weren't allowed to market ourselves. We had to keep our heads down, and it was word of mouth. And if you got to know people. They thought you were good, then you get repeat work. But the world is a totally different place now, and people tend to go to different sources when they're looking for lawyers, barristers and solicitors. So you, it is just axiomatic that you have to have a full internet profile. You need to be able to market and sell yourself in every way you possibly can. If you can get your face on TV or on the internet or in the newspapers, preferably for the right reasons, there's a lot more of this celebrity idea that goes on with people getting work, it seems to me. Oh yes, we know that name. It's like voting for the you know someone on you know, voting for uh, Pauline Hanson. Oh, we know that name. Yeah, I know. We've seen her on TV. Yeah, I know. Well, we'll, we'll vote for her. We don't know the others. So you know, if there's if that sort of idea about a high profile, is going to help because people select their lawyers on a different basis these days. The other, and the other thing I think is to take steps to try to identify solicitors who still value and rely on the bar. There, there are firms around that still actually see the value of an independent bar and want to use them. So you need to find out who they are and try and get on their list. Um, and, and, stray, and stay away from those people who seem to be using the bar as an absolute last resort. Like if you sit around waiting for the phone to ring from some firms, you, you, know, you, could, um, you could starve to death. So the other thing, teaching is one of the things. Teaching feels that you know something about it. And you're talking, you're teaching to young people usually who might be coming to the bar or they're in human resources or in, in insurance companies. There are a million things you can think about where you can have a presence that where people will get to know you. Because if they don't know who you are, they're not going to ring you. You know, that you might get found, you might get lucky and you get a referral. But it is a dog-eat-dog -dog world and you need to take active steps. I listed down the, down the page here organisations that come to mind. Major insurance brokers, 
When people have trouble, the f often they, the first people they ring are their insurance brokers, for obvious reasons. Am I going to be covered for this? this where do, what do I do here? You know, I'm, going to, I'm getting sued or I'm, I need to sue somebody. Am I going to be covered? And I've spoken to insurance brokers. They're very influential in a lot of businesses. And there are big insurance brokers firms that you could go and, and talk to. Rotary, Legacy, regional law societies, they're crying out for getting people to come and talk to them. They don't get much good service in the country, you know, good professional sort of lecturing from people. There's AHRA, the, the Australian Human Resources Association. There's AIDC, the company directors. It's expensive to do, but it might be worth your while, money-wise, to try to pay money, which you have to do, pay money to go and address them at one of their conferences. Um, the, or get on, if you can get into, a, into an opportunity to teach at one of their courses, then you meet a lot of people who either are directors or who are becoming directors who need a lot of help. I've just done the course myself. And, and the hot topics at board level were a lot of it to do with employment issues, stress claims, OH&S. These are at board level now, you know, bullying and sexual harassment. All these things are now worrying the hell out of directors about their personal exposure and they're not getting enough support or training. There's the, the two accounting bodies, the CPA and the ICAA, that odd idea about two major bodies. Remind me of the, what was the, the uh, People's Front of Judea and the Judean People's Front in, in, the, in the life of Brian and the rivalry between those. Um, In-house councils association, that's another body that charges you money. That's, that's obviously something that I'm finally going to talk about. Uh, but in-house councils association, that's a growing organisation and if you have a look at their site, there are people we know, I think David Chin, uh, Shane, I think he's on the New South Wales, uh, uh, he has an association with the committee of that organisation. Uh, and so obviously, if, even again, pay money to go and address in-house council, because that's something we've got, that's a button I think we have to push big time. Um, and then there's the, uh, the Retail Traders Association, AIG, the ACTU, Franchise Council of Australia, and that's only me putting that down in five seconds flat. But that's the, sort, that's the client base at a peak level. There's a p potential to get an enormous amount of work. I've, I volunteered to do a thing for UTS, for, yeah, for UTS who train advocates in uh, industrial tribunals. And I, I went along and I talked about mediation and communication and the, my usual forte. And I did it on Wednesday night. The following day, I had nine people on LinkedIn looking at my profile and some of them seeking to connect. And these were mainly young people who were just starting out. So that was an example of an older person now putting myself in a position where all of a sudden younger people said, gee, we're lucky to have found this bloke. And you know, there's, that's, a, that's a good lead for me, nine people now looking at my website. So, so, that's, so that's really the, the, the nub of it. The, the idea of accreditation as a mediator, arbitrator, train yourself as a negotiator, effective communicator, facilitator, conflict coach, all these, these things are coming. And if you, if you countenance, if you can countenance diversifying, then diversification is obviously one of the protections against the threats that we uh, all face. Um, the last thing I'll mention then is the question of these start-up firms. We've checked the rules and it appears that there is no, there is no Bar Rule 16 says that there's no opposition to you owning shares in a company that runs a law practice, you can't be a director. But Burbage's idea of 15 or 20 years ago is something that could be done. So you could set up a firm, uh, highlight, market yourself to, to in-house counsel uh, on a direct access basis, do what you can to get the work through the door, and then to the extent they need the solicitor, say, yeah, he's down the corridor, um, and you could have a practice that you could have an interest in uh, as long as you weren't a director of it. So I think that I'm sensing a lot more interest in that uh, in the, when it was first mooted here. You now everyone sort of thought it was a bit of a crazy idea. I don't think it's seen as so crazy anymore. The empire's got to strike back at some stage because the trends aren't good in terms of the independent bar. Like it has to be said that you know, advocacy work is dropping. Um, and so this would be a way to actually claw some of the work away from the solicitors. So, OK, we'll get round behind you to the client base. And there's no law again. Direct access is direct access. was for. So then the final thing about thinking and planning for your career more generally, how long do you want to be a litigator? And whether you want to, uh, want to be or accept that you may have to be a dispute preventer, resolver, um, or something like that, so that you can then consider how and when you might transition from being a litigator into a facilitator, dispute preventer, or, or move into a solicitor's firm as a consultant or special counsel, or into some other field of endeavour. So the idea of transition 
is something that uh, needs to be looked at. What am I going to do next if the litigation runs out or if I get old and all my solicitors die? You know, what do I do then? Um, you'll be pleased to hear, Fiona also did, we did have a little bit of a survey of clerks and we got some very useful responses. Fiona and, and one of the other clerks has put, to, put together a document and I, uh, a survey that I drafted and, and the, it's interesting just to finish on this note because I think the issue of, of accessing clerks and getting their perspective, sur uh, surveying solicitors and say, how do they feel about the bar now? Uh, like, it's pretty disturbing what you see online when, that, when, when solicitors firms describe the relationship between barristers and solicitors. We're seen as there to help the solicitors and you don't really, we, don't, we use barristers only as a last resort. The language is not, <laughs> is not good. But the clerks, uh, the, the, to the extent we got feedback thus far, uh, to the question, what do you think that barristers need to do to maximise the viability and sustainability of their practices? Market themselves, don't be complacent and rely on the same solicitors. Uh, uh, solicitors tend to retire before their colleagues at the bar and that leaves a hole in barristers' practice and they need to keep fostering new relationships. They need to be seen, get on the marketing lecture circuit. They need to embrace in-house counsel. They need to embrace technology. They need to promote juniors, it's a two-way game. They need to be on LinkedIn, even if only as an address book, to click and accept. They need to be diverse in the way they approach their practice. So there, on, on, on just a straight feed out saying, what do you reckon, that's what came back, and only for a small number of clerks. And it completely confirms the views that seem to be obvious anyway. I think the problem has been is that, that a lot of this stuff, I probably haven't said very much that's new, other than disturbing data about self-represented litigants, which is a hallmark of the problem. Um, but what, what has happened is that there's been a lot of talk but not much action, and, and I think it really is time that the, the independent bar you know, cranks itself into gear to do more to, you know, to protect the profession. That would be my thinking anyway. Thank you.